My name's Steve Davies. Uh, I'm official, my official title is I'm the head of education at the IEA. I think it's about introducing new ideas uh, and also challenging received wisdom in a number of areas, uh, but also raising, if you like, difficult questions, conundrums, because I don't think anybody uh, from any part of the intellectual or political spectrum should claim or pretend that they know exactly what is going on and what all the answers are. Well done for all of you for coming here. And as I say, I'm delighted to actually be here with you in person rather than staring at you from a screen. Uh, not quite the same experience, I think it's fair to say. Uh, this conference uh, kicks off our whole summer program of uh, academic and outreach events in which we uh, offer a whole lot of opportunities to young people like uh, most of the audience here I see looking out at you, uh, various kinds of student programs. So we have another one starting in a couple of days, uh, a residential uh, summer course at which is being held at the University of Buckingham in the Vincent Centre. Uh, and then we have uh, uh, three weeks of, or two weeks, sorry, of sixth form uh, programmes, uh, followed by a, another summer school uh, held here in London at the IEA offices. Uh, and what I'd flag up is that the uh, spaces have just opened up, or the applications have just opened up, uh, for a slightly more advanced seminar, which we ran for the first time last year, uh, the Economic Thought Leaders Symposium, which will be held this year on the 7th to 9th of September. Uh, and that's a kind of follow-up or further development uh, program for people who have already been to previous programs. So if you fall into that category, uh, or you're at the stage of your education, uh, late uh, undergraduate or newly graduate, uh, then you should definitely go onto the website uh, and apply for that program. Uh, and also keep an eye open for all of the other programs and events uh, that we run throughout the year uh, as part of our academic uh, and outreach and educational outreach, which is obviously a central part of what the IEA does, given that we're an educational charity. Uh, a couple of things briefly about myself. Uh, you'll be seeing me popping up on the stage regularly throughout the day uh, to introduce speakers and the like. My name's Steve Davies. Uh, I'm official, my official title is I'm the head of education at the IEA. Uh, IEA has more heads than a Hydra, I think. Um, and uh, uh, I've been working uh, with the IEA uh, for about 12 years now, although I actually have a connection with the IEA that goes all the way back to when I first met Ralph Harris, the then Director General, uh, when I was an undergraduate student at St Andrews in 1972. So I've, I've got a connection that goes back a very long way. Uh, I'm a historian by training, uh, although an economic historian by development. Uh, I moved from being a uh, political historian of early modern Europe into being a kind of more global economic historian. And I, in a previous life, I was uh, in the Department of History and Economic History at Manchester Metropolitan University for uh, some 30 years before, about 10 years ago, 12 years ago now actually, I jacked that in and I went full-time to think tankery and freelance work, so to speak. Uh, I have got a number of other interests. Uh, some of you who know me will, will know this. I'm, I'm a big fan of science fiction. Uh, I'm uh, into various kinds of popular music, notably heavy metal music, which fits in with some of my other uh, interests, it's fair to say. Uh, and, of course, uh, as someone who lives in Manchester for many years and a, a Mancunian, I support the team from Manchester that plays in blue and not the one from near Manchester that plays in red. Uh, so uh, I'm feeling, you know... Feeling pretty cheerful at the moment, I think it's fair to say. Uh, and if ever, I, ever I'm sort of feeling down the dumps, uh, I just need to think of one of the funniest jokes ever. Uh, Harry Maguire cost £80 million. <laughs> That's, uh, hard to believe, eh? Uh, anyway, <laughs> what, what I'm going to do now uh, is, if you like, give a, a little talk uh, with some Q&A afterwards, which in a way is designed to set the stage for the kind of things you're going to be hearing throughout the day. Because, as Brittany said... Uh, think is about introducing new ideas uh, and also challenging received wisdom in a number of areas, uh, but also raising, if you like, difficult questions, conundrums, because I don't think anybody uh, from any part of the intellectual or political spectrum should claim or pretend that they know exactly what is going on and what all the answers are. Uh, what I want to do just now is to set out, if you like, what I think the challenges are facing us at the moment. 
Uh, by us, I mean, really, in some sense, the, you know, everyone in this country, or indeed the entire human species, but also, more particularly, those amongst those larger groups who adhere to and support the principles of liberalism, broadly defined, uh, which I'll say more about later on. Because I think it's fair to say uh, that... Uh, in one sense, you could say there are storm clouds on the horizon. Uh, as somebody famous once said, a hard rains are going to fall. Uh, great song, by the way. And really, we are facing some very severe challenges. Uh, but those challenges also present opportunities. Uh, as, again, people have said, every challenge looked at in the right way is also an opportunity. And these are opportunities, particularly for younger people, because I think that a time when a lot of accepted uh, political economic orthodoxies are being challenged and shaken up is also a time of great opportunity uh, for people to engage with the ideas and to come up with both analyses and policies and proposals that will enable uh, things that are, if you like, of permanent value to survive the challenges that the current world uh, is throwing our way. So what are, uh, what is that kind of challenge? And uh, it's really what you might say, the context is a crisis of the global system. Now, what do I mean by that? Well, in the, year after, in the years immediately after World War II, starting perhaps with the Bretton Woods Conference in 1944, a kind of global order was created by uh, the victorious Western Allies, the United States, uh, the European powers that had supported it during the war, and also, subsequently, some of the defeated powers, notably Japan and Germany, of course. And this system involved both an international economic order created through GATT uh, and the Bretton Woods Monetary Agreements and subsequent uh, economic agreements, notably the creation of the EU, uh, which created a new kind of trading system and a global economic order uh, which was intended to undo the damage done by the chaotic economic nationalism of the central decades of the 20th century, and, but which was in many ways different from the completely open free trade system or largely open free trade system that you'd had in the world before 1914. So you had a different kind of international monetary system, uh, you had a different kind of trading system because although people talk about free trade agreements these days, they're not actually free trade in the classical sense. What they are is regulation harmonization agreements and they're about essentially constructing a system of managed trade. And so over the years, through the various rounds of GATT, this international economic order was built up. At the same time, an international security order was created uh, with pillars such as to some extent, the United Nations, although that was always contested, but more importantly, NATO and a number of other uh, military and political alliances. All this, of course, is in the context of a systemic competition with the other victor of World War II, uh, the Soviet Union uh, and its allies uh, and client states. And so you have the period, of course, from about 1948 through to 1989, where there's a world order created by the Western powers but there's also a rival uh, order centered around the Soviet Union. And since 1989, of course, the Soviet Union is no longer with us. Uh, and the world order created after World War II is then extended and consolidated, also significantly amended, particularly in the 1970s, when the monetary aspect of that world order underwent a considerable change. So that is the world that I grew up in. Uh, and it's the world, if you like, which I think is now coming to an end, uh, or if indeed it has not already ended. The order that those statesmen and women created after World War II and then consolidated and extended after 1989 is now facing a whole series of fundamental challenges. And it's in a way a bit of a commonplace to say uh, that it's facing challenges so severe uh, that really it is not going to be able to survive in its present form. Uh, and this obviously poses enormous challenges for uh, all people, but particularly people of a liberal persuasion. Because the great risk, uh, the kind of nightmare, if you like, that haunts uh, those who think seriously about this, uh, is that we are going to see a reversion back to the kind of uh, interne international chaos uh, that took place in the 1930s and led to the disaster of World War II. Uh, in other words, the great fear is that we'll see a resurgence of things like nationalism, protectionism, aggressive revanchism, uh, military competition, and all of the other uh, bad things that happened between roughly 1919 and 1945. 
And of course, at the moment, I don't need to tell you, uh, in Eastern Europe and Ukraine, we're seeing the largest war fought in Europe since uh, 1945, and the first real peer-to-peer -peer conflict between two military powers of roughly equal technological status that's been fought anywhere in the world since World War II. Uh, now, what is the nature of that, uh, this crisis then, this uh, crisis of the world order that we face, or the gradual breakdown of the existing world order. Well, the most obvious uh, is geopol geopolitics. What we can clearly see now uh, with the war in Ukraine, but also with the kind of trends that were apparent in world politics before even the pandemic came and hit us, but which have been intensified since, uh, is the growth of what you might call challenger powers. Uh, powers such as China and Russia, but also a number of others, uh, which do not see themselves as part of that world order, which they see, uh, to some degree correctly, as being the creation of the United States and serving United States and Western interests. And so you have a number of insurgent or rising powers. As the evidence of history shows, that's a very dangerous situation. Uh, one of the reasons why the 20th century was so disastrous was because political leaders did not handle very well the rise of Germany and other insurgent powers in the late 19th century. And we're in a similar position now. Uh, and Xi Jinping and uh, Vladimir Putin have made it very clear in this last year that they see themselves as leading a kind of assault upon what they see as a hostile world order. Uh, headed by the US. Uh, on the other hand, over here in Europe, Emmanuel Macron, who, uh, whatever else you may think about him, a very annoying man in many ways, um, is also a strategic and systematic thinker of a kind that is rather lacking, I'm afraid to say, in British politics these days. Uh, he has also argued that there's a need for uh, a significant amendment or change to the world order. Uh, he obviously sees himself playing a major part in it. Uh, that's one of the you know, features of his way of thinking about the world. Uh, but you have to say that in many ways his diagnosis is very correct. So we're seeing, if you like, the breakdown of a geopolitical order, which was bipolar up until 1989, and really unipolar, effectively, uh, from there on after up until very recently. Uh, all kinds of little bits of news snippets that illustrate this. For example, it was announced just the other day that uh, China launched yet another aircraft carrier uh, the, other, the other day, uh, it now outnumbers the United States uh, in terms of carrier battle groups in the East Asian theater. Uh, the United States has far more carrier battle groups, but they're spread all over the surface of the planet, whereas China's navy is concentrated in the East and South China seas. Uh, so you can see there an example of the kind of geopolitical competition that I'm talking about. The second is uh, economically. Now, what the pandemic did, uh, as I have sort of explained personally in a couple of talks I've done for the IEA, was to accelerate trends that were already present in the world economy. And one of them was a breakdown of the level of globalization and economic integration that had been achieved by the decade of the 2010s, roughly. Uh, the pandemic is blamed for having disrupted a lot of supply chains and caused enormous disruption of uh, economic trade links and connections, still ongoing. Uh, all kinds of little small signs that tell you that something is not at all right with the world trade system right now. So just personal anecdote here, uh, I'm moving into a new house at the moment, got to um, have a new bathroom put in, uh, can't get the floor put in or completed anyway, uh, because the flooring uh, is simply not available, out of stock. Uh, why is it out of stock? Well, because uh, all of the stock they need is on a ship which is stuck in uh, Shanghai, basically, uh, because of the lockdowns that the Chinese have imposed. Uh, not only in Shanghai, by the way, but in most of their major metropolitan areas. Uh, and what this actually demonstrates is something that I think had become apparent before the pandemic came, which is the degree to which, if you like, our economic system, and particularly economic trade production distribution systems, have become excessively complex, uh, and also too efficient. Uh, it, the, you might think um, 
especially at a conference run by an economic institute, uh, that how can you have too much efficiency? Uh, efficiency surely is a good thing. Well, not necessarily. One of the things you also learn from economics is the principle of diminishing marginal returns. You can have too much of a good thing. And I think it's pretty clear from this and a number of other examples that the world has become too efficient. There is simply not enough margin for error or slack or redundancy in many of our economic systems. And the result is that when they face almost any kind of shock, they prove to be highly brittle. Uh, and that is what we can see going on at the moment from the pandemic, but also from other things, such as the war in Ukraine, for example, uh, but many, many other kinds of shocks, various kinds of effects of climate change, for example. And so the result is that our whole um, economy is now, if you like, pulling back from the level of globalization that was reached uh, about 10 to 12 years ago. We are seeing a kind of rather messy and complicated process of economic disintegration, if you will. And it's not clear that many of the uh, institutions or uh, frameworks, uh, institutional frameworks that have been created since 1989 are going to be able to cope with this. We'll probably hear more about this from one of our speakers later on in the day. At the same time also, the world monetary system uh, is under... Uh, severe stress, I think it's fair to say right now, because of the unprecedented monetary response by central banks to the financial crisis of 2008 and then since then the pandemic. Uh, What you may have heard of is a theory that's become rather popular in certain circles recently, modern monetary theories it's called, uh, which basically says governments have no shortage of money. There is a magic money tree. You can just print money. When you want to do something, just print money for it. And I have to say, my own view is that um, as a description of the kind of monetary system we have had since 1971, I think this is actually 100% accurate. It, you know, as an empirical description of what we have as a monetary system, I think the MMT people are completely correct. What I, where I differ with them and where I think anybody of sense would differ with them, is in the response that you make to that uh, evaluation. Because uh, the modern monetary theorist people say, oh, this is fantastic. Look at all the wonderful, cool things we can do. And my reaction is, my God, you do not want this kind of monetary system. Uh, This could lead to all sorts of really, really bad stuff if you're not careful. Uh, And I think the reality is that until about 14 years ago or so, uh, the world's monetary authorities didn't actually take advantage of all of the levers and buttons they had at their disposal, and then subsequently following the crisis, they did. And they're a bit like a child who's been in a large, complicated, uh, you know, institution or uh, installation that's called a nuclear reactor or something, and they thought, ooh, I wonder what'll happen if I push this red button. Maybe I need to do that, and they've done it. Um, And the result has been uh, what we're seeing now, which is uh, a situation where really I'm very, very glad that I'm not a central banker because uh, if, I'm, if you're a central banker now, uh, you have to make a choice between two really unpalatable alternatives. You've got to either raise interest rates and cause a debt crisis, or you have to not raise interest rates and have inflation become sustained and maybe even worse. Uh, so we're, we're in a serious monetary disorder, the worst we've seen since the 1970s, actually, in my view. And then finally, um, there's a crisis of political order. Uh, And this has manifested itself in most countries around the world in the rise of what are called, very misleadingly in my view, populist movements of both left and right. Uh, Movements that reject, uh, explicitly and openly reject, liberal principles uh, of government uh, and the rest. And in particular, the issue that is coming to the fore now, uh, as I don't need to tell you here in the UK, is that of one of the major features of the world order, which was the way in which governments bound themselves by agreements to take away a lot of their freedom of action so that they would be subordinated to international regulatory bodies of various kinds. Human rights commissions, the World Trade Organization, things of this sort. And what we're seeing at the moment is a huge pushback against this. Uh, And the kind of common sentiment and rising sentiment at the moment is that of what you might call absolute democratic majoritarianism. Uh, The idea that basically if the people want something, never mind what the people is, they should get it. Uh, It reminds me of H.L. Mencken's uh, idea, famous remark, that the principle of democracy is that the people should get what they want and get it good and hard. 
Uh, and you might think, well, yes, that's the way to go. Uh, but actually, uh, one of the fundamentals of liberal arguments uh, for a very, very long time is that democratic majorities, any more than any other kind of source of political power, should be limited, and they shouldn't get what they want all the time. Uh, then there should be limits put upon political power. But the form that that kind of limit has taken is now facing challenges uh, on a scale and to an extent that has not been the case for a very long time. Now, two, uh, that's the nature of the crisis then. We're, we're seeing a kind of multifold crisis, if you like, of the broadly liberal with a small L order that, as I say, was created after World War II and consolidated after uh, 1989. Now, it has, I don't have have time to go into this, but it has a couple of sources. Uh, and a lot of what we need to think about is how to deal with these sources. One of them is ultimately physical reality, in my my opinion. I think that we are, at the moment, with the technology that we have, we are pushing up against a number of uh, Malthusian limits. Now, that doesn't mean we're running out of stuff, because that, that's not the way it works. What it means is that increasingly, notably in oil, but also in a number of other commodities and areas, you can only get as much of that stuff as you need for various activities if you pay a very high price for it. Uh, and this is to do with geology as much as anything else. And when you're in that position, you then have to make tough decisions because it turns out that the cost is such that you can only, for example, consume large amounts of oil by consuming uh, less of other things. As I say, absent major technological developments or institutional changes, there are various ways of resolving or addressing this question. Uh, but at the moment, people haven't really started thinking about it. Uh, the other thing is that we're facing an ideological assault. Uh, what I think people of a broadly liberal persuasion uh, have become in the last 20 to 30 years is complacent. We have tended to assume that the principles of democracy and open society, limited government, the rule of law, things of that sort are unquestionable. Nobody of any good sense, we think, would challenge these. Well, that kind of complacency, if anybody still has it, should be over now. Uh, the speeches and remarks of people like uh, the Chinese leadership, the Russian leadership, uh, leadership of other countries, such as Narendra Modi for, in India, for example, should tell us that large parts of the world now are led and politically controlled by people who explicitly reject those kind of ideas, who define themselves overtly and strongly as being opposed to the project of a liberal civilization. So we're dealing with, as I say, an ideological assault, uh, one that we've not seen for a very long time, uh, and different from the one that uh, we faced during the Cold War, because there it was associated with a very particular place and regime, uh, whereas now you're dealing with something much more multifarious and varied. Uh, and although there are certain countries which are if you like, leading this challenge, China and Russia being the two most obvious ones, uh, it's not as clearly or straightforwardly identified with one particular power or part of the world as it was the case before. Now, how do we respond to this? Um, I mentioned Emmanuel Macron a moment ago, and one of the things uh, he has begun to argue, which I think is completely correct, uh, is that we can't simply look to restore uh, or uh, refurbish that world order that is currently in crisis. Humpty Dumpty has fallen off the wall, uh, and as you all know from the nursery rhyme, can't be put back together again. That order, if you like, uh, for material reasons as much as anything else, uh, is not going to survive. What we need to make sure, the project that we, or the challenge facing us, is to make sure that it is not the other side who win, that it is not replaced by an order that is profoundly antithetical to and hostile to liberal principles and beliefs. So we, we can't simply go back to uh, the way they were. What I think also is important, and here is where I think um, uh, President Macron is perhaps not on the right lines, is that we, sh we need to move away from what has become the predominant form of politics and intellectual argument in the last 20 years or so, which is what you might call technocratic managerialism. Because a lot of people involved in think tanks, policy formation, uh, political theory, intellectual argument analysis over the last uh, 20 years or more have ex basically expounded the view that most of the social political problems uh, facing the world are not ethical problems or problems of principle, they're problems of technique 
which are amenable to and susceptible to resolution by smart policy, uh, technological tweaks, and that really the way politics should be uh, is that it should be an activity conducted by and carried on by a class of neutral experts, uh, typically people with lots of advanced degrees. Uh, now, uh, I can't say how strongly I disagree with all this, actually. Uh, I, I speak as somebody with an advanced degree myself, uh, but partly because of that, I think that having people like me running the world would be a recipe for disaster, quite frankly. Uh, and people will say to you, well, surely you want smart people in charge. No, absolutely not. Having smart people in charge is a recipe for disaster. You do not want smart people in charge. Smart people, the best and the brightest, as somebody once called them, and um, look how that worked out, um, basically enormously overestimate how much they know and more importantly, how much the world is uh, controllable and predictable. They underestimate both their own ignorance and the uh, systematic randomness of much of the world and of human life. What you want is people with good judgment, which is not the same thing. That's, what, that's why when Napoleon was uh, you know, considering a candidate for promotion for Marshall, the question he always asked was, is he lucky? Uh, and what he actually meant by that was, does this person have a track record that shows that they've tended to consistently make the right decisions? Uh, and those are the kind of people you want in charge. Uh, generally speaking, very clever people have an alarmingly high propensity to silliness. Um, and this is not the way you want to go. So I think that what we need to really do, in fact, this should be the starting point of my concluding remarks, is that we need to move away from uh, the idea of a technocratic managerial politics and elite. We need to move much more towards a more open kind of politics that moves away from this idea that there are uh, technical fixes for various kinds of important political and economic issues. So what are the things that I think, the challenges that face us, and what are the opportunities that these then present, particularly for younger people like most of yourselves, because you're the ones who are going to be doing the heavy lifting over the next uh, 30 to 40 years as we move on. The first thing is we need to rediscover and articulate fundamental liberal principles. Uh, we need to, if you like, rediscover what it is that we value in liberal civilization and what those foundational principles are. And it may surprise you <laughs> that I don't think economics uh, counts really, as one of those fundamental liberal principles. Not that economics is unimportant, but the economic principles are, if you like, the secondary or consequential deductions that follow on from the more fundamental principles. Uh, I think it's a mistake to think that uh, you start off with an economic philosophy. The economic philosophy should be the, the consequence or follow on, if you like, the corollary uh, of uh, more profound principles, ethical, moral, political principles. And what are these? Well, they're the ones, the kind of things I alluded to. The rule of law. The idea that government should not be arbitrary. It should be bound by rules. It should not reflect the whims of people with power. A government of laws and not of men, as it was famously said. The idea of limited government. The idea that the sphere of politics, of collective coercive decision-making, should be limited and that most of life should be left to the free choice of individuals and voluntary cooperation. The principle of decentralization, uh, of having decisions taken at the lowest possible level, subsidiarity, as Catholic social thinkers call it. The idea of a culture that emphasizes personal responsibility, uh, taking responsibility for your own actions and the consequences of those actions. Uh, and what that implies in terms of the moral judgments that you make both about yourself and about those around you. Those are just a few of them. Uh, I'm sure you can think of others, such as, for example, the principle of free and open discussion, uh, free speech, in other words, uh, and the ways in which that needs to be instantiated and supported. Now, the second thing, though, which follows on from that, and uh, speech perhaps is an example of that, is that the challenge really, but the opportunity, is to create and develop new institutional frameworks. Because I think, uh, in many ways, the institutional frameworks that those very great people created after 1944 are exhausted. 
So what do we need to go for? How are we going to organize international trade uh, and international commerce and business uh, in the world that we're moving into? What kind of political order do we want to have? Do you really want to have this kind of governance by a kind of clergy, which is what it is effectively, uh, of uh, lawyers and experts? You don't want to have untrammeled um, political power, but on the other hand, what is the best way of checking it? Is reliance upon the kind of institutions that I was talking about earlier on the best way of doing this? Maybe we want to go to the idea of having things like citizens' juries, for example. That's just an, an, an idea. I'm not saying that I necessarily agree with that. But there are lots of ideas we need to explore and think about there in terms of what kind of institutional framework we want now for politics. What about the way in which commerce and business are organized? What about the way in which economic life is organized? Uh, I think there's a whole range of uh, you know, ideas that need to be explored, things that need to be thought about uh, in the context that I've just set out to you. And then finally, uh, there's you know, a question that, uh, or there's something which I would really emphasize as my concluding point. Um, you should never stop asking questions. Uh, whenever, uh, you know, somebody says, oh, you can't do that, one of the questions should be, well, why not? Uh, you know, the, um, you may well discover after you've examined things more closely that no, you can't do whatever X is, uh, but you should never take things for granted or just assume things. Always subject things to question. And also, and finally, um, you should never lose hope. Uh, hope is one of the great virtues, one of the three theological virtues, of course. Not the same thing as optimism. Um, optimism is the belief that things are getting better. Sometimes that's true. But not always. Uh, things can get worse, as the old Yorkshire saying has it. Uh, and they do usually, sometimes that's how it follows on. Uh, hope is the belief or the, the assurance that things can be better than they are. That the world as it is, is not something that you simply have to put up with and accept. Uh, and that, there's a reason why that is a virtue. The attitude of hope, the refusal to accept bad features of the world as being ineluctable, inescapable, uh, unavoidable, something you have to simply make the best of. That's a fundamental feature of both good moral character at the individual level and of a good politics at the collective level. So that's my final sort of thing. Things are very challenging at the moment, but you should never give up hope. Uh, and all, as, as a city fan, I can certainly speak from experience here. Uh, and also as a city fan, I can tell you, hope does indeed bring its own reward. So thank you very much. Uh, and I think that leaves us with about nine minutes for questions. Well, if you enjoyed that conversation, why not watch one of these other videos? And while you're here, remember to hit the subscribe button and the notification bell. That way, you'll never miss out on a single IEA broadcast.